a little bit of an introduction to myself. So this particular position that I am in was actually just uh, approved by the state legislature this past year. So I'm very, very fortunate for that opportunity. So my responsibilities are 100% soybean pathology. Uh, that's uh, where I'm going to spend um, all of my time working in a very applied extension research. So uh, to kind of jump into today's talk, I'm going to kind of introduce what we saw in the 2023 growing season. Um, I'm a big football guy, so I like to make football analogies throughout my presentations. And so I am kind of using this as, as my, my all state offensive line. Okay. So um, in left tackle, we got Brown stem rot. We found pretty consistently across most of the state, um, somewhat low levels in some areas, but again, very consistent across the state. Uh, left guard is Phytophthora root and stem rot. So this is one of the biggest issues here within the state year in and year out. Uh, we did find this quite a bit uh, across the state from the eastern side all the way over to the western side of the state, uh, particularly up by the Minot region. Um, and then soybean cyst nematode is the center for this particular analogy here. Uh, again, very high incidence across most of the state, especially in the eastern portion. Um, with the greatest history of SCN, again, hot and dry conditions were driving this particular disease. Charcoal rot is right guard. And so charcoal rot, again, hot and dry conditions like we saw throughout most, most of the season this year, uh, was really driving um, a lot of this particular disease. And then finally, at right tackle uh, is white mold. And white mold had very high pockets of disease that were developed. Um, and then white mold will be discussed by Michael Bunch after my presentation today. So um, those are the, the five that we saw most consistently across the state. And then today we'll talk about soybean cyst nematode and then uh, touch on phytophthora root and stem rot. It's some active research that we're doing in that right now. So SCN is a worm. Uh, this is not like other plant pathogens, which are fungi or bacterial. Um, this particular one is an animal, just like you and I. Uh, this, this worm here hatched out of an egg, just like what is shown in the screen here. Um, and these are, uh, they live under the soil uh, around the soybean roots. Uh, when these, these, these little worms get into the, the soybean roots themselves, they create these little cysts, which are the females of that worm. Um, they begin swelling up forming these cysts, which then contain new eggs for uh, future generations. We can see how small they are relative to nodules on root tissue. Um, but in severe cases, we can see these cysts very prevalently across these root tissues. And this is a very uh, severe example here in eastern portion of the state um, with a susceptible variety. So across the northern U.S., SCN is the number one yield reducing disease year in and year out. Okay. Um, oftentimes SCN does reduce yields uh, more than double the number two yield reducing disease. Okay. Again, driving home that this is a very important disease, but we may not see um, symptomology wise. So in order to talk about most diseases, it's really important to think about the disease cycle and the life cycle of that pathogen. So these, these little worms, they survive in the soil for many years as what we call cysts. Um, these cysts are, uh, they contain up to 200 eggs per cyst. And then during the growing season, as we can see here in number two, these cysts will then release these eggs into that soil. Um, and each of those eggs contain a single worm that is then moved, starts moving around that soil, um, trying to uh, find and penetrate into the soybean root tissue. Once these worms get into that root tissue, they begin sucking out the nutrients from that root, uh, kind of like a straw through a juice box, um, slowly sucking away all the water and the nutrients that that soybean is putting into that root. Um, it's really important that these uh, that the, the SCN keeps the host alive so that uh, they can reproduce and continue their life cycle um, through the next generation. Okay. This entire cycle does take about four weeks to go from cyst to brand new cyst. 
And so because of that, we are able to get about two to three full generations of SEN in this state, um, oftentimes leading to substantial increases in the number of eggs that are present within the field between the spring and the fall, okay? When talking about SCN, it's really important to understand uh, at what level that these eggs are starting to cause some detrimental effects. Uh, this is a great image by Berlin Nelson uh, on dry bean, looking at SCN quantities within that soil. Um, the first, the middle one is the control. So there are zero SCN present. On the left are 5,000 eggs of SCN. We see a little bit of stunting, but overall that plant still looks really good. And then on the right hand side, we see about 10,000 eggs where we see that severe stunting of that plant. But again, it is still alive. You don't see the symptomology other than that stunting at this point. So what we typically say is that the 10,000 eggs is kind of that threshold in which we say is, is high and we need to actively manage it um, appropriately. So we have a really great program here in the state of North Dakota. Uh, the Soybean Council does provide funding each year for free soil sampling for SCN counts, um, in which that these, these bags through AgVise are provided through the county extension offices, are provided to growers um, to collect soybean samples from their fields to understand what their egg levels um, look like within their, their own operation. And so this is a uh, kind of data presenting of from that soil uh, sampling program that's been established uh, since 2013. Um, what we focus on are these black dots. These black dots represent that there were no SCN identified. The gray boxes represent when there were very, very few, which we oftentimes call inconclusive. Um, and then once we start getting into the colorful symbols is when we start to say these are positive reports of SCN, okay? Again, focusing on those yellow being that 10,000 egg limit, and then moving up uh, into the red with 20,000. And so we can see that the majority of these SCN issues are identified in the eastern portion of the state, which is no surprise is where they've been established for the longest and the greatest concentration of soybean production. But we can find SCN present throughout most of the state um, and counties going all the way onto the western side uh, around Botno region too. So in order to manage for SCN, uh, we, we try to push for two, two, two main things here, okay? First is going to be soil sampling, and then it's going to be active management, okay, through control of resistance and crop rotations. So soil sampling is incredibly important for two reasons. One, if that field has not had a report of SCN present, uh, soil sampling can initially confirm or deny the presence of SCN. So if that field does not have it, it's important to sample to identify that first appearance. And then secondly, if SCN is known to be present, uh, soil sampling can help to confirm whether or not management strategies are actively managing SCN or if they are not actively managing this, okay? Uh, we have some really great resources available through the SCN Coalition. SCN Coalition is a group of individuals across different universities as well as industry. Um, put it grouped together, uh, some extension and outreach material for growers to use, such as this one on the right-hand side for scouting and soil testing. This does provide information for how to perform soil testing and different patterns and the protocol that should be used. Once we know and identify that SCN is present within that field, we want to start to manage it actively. And so the way we can do this first is through resistance. Now, resistance, we try to split this up again, and that resistance is going to pay twice, okay? And first, we like to think of it as in this current year, resistance is going to protect that yield, um, uh, comparatively to a susceptible. So this is data here. Uh, from Ted Helm was back in 2012, looking at a susceptible check comparatively to average resistant lines, okay, um, for SCN. And we're looking at yield here. And what we can find is that across all three of these locations, that the resistant variety is out yielding these susceptibles um, at a pretty substantial level. Again, in 2015, 
that same color pattern, uh, we can see again, the resistant varieties are out yielding these susceptibles um, under these high SCN conditions. Next, resistance is also going to pay in the fact that it's gonna protect, uh, protect and reduce those egg levels, keeping them low, protecting that future yield in year two and three potentially, okay? So this is a data set again from Ted Helms. Um, this was in the early uh, 2010s um, in which we're looking at egg counts now on the y-axis and not yield. And we see that scale from zero up to 30,000. Okay, Again, looking at that 10,000 egg limit as being that threshold that we talked about earlier. And then now, instead of susceptible resistance, we're looking at a spring sampling. So beginning of the season egg levels comparatively to the end of the season egg levels. And we can see across these three varieties here that we have has seen eggs jump from less than 1,000 all the way up over to 26, 27,000 eggs in a single season. All right. Again, paying attention to that 10,000 egg limit. But then when we look at five resistant varieties, same again, looking at eggs on the y-axis, but I wanna point out here that the, the axis, this y-axis is no longer up to 30,000, but it's up to 2,500, okay? So the scale is much, much reduced comparatively to the previous slide. Again, looking at spring sampling to fall sampling, and we can see that the uh, the amount of eggs that are increasing, that they may increase slightly in some of these varieties, but the degree to which they're increasing is much reduced, indicating here that these resistant varieties can help maintain low egg levels going into the next field season. So when we talk about resistance, we, we primarily have one source of resistance called PI88788. Now, this is data out of Iowa from 91 up to 2023, so up to this growing season, looking at the number of varieties available to growers uh, with these sources of resistance. And what we find here um, is that there are 779 varieties available with 88788, and then there are 87 varieties that have an alternate form called peaking. And this peaking um, is, is uh, very important for resistance um, for ver uh, SEN populations that are overcoming 88788. Now, I want to point out here, imagine this is a weed management program, just like Joe Eichley was talking about. Now, imagine this 88788 was a single herbicide that was being used. All right. Can you imagine what would happen if we are relying on a single form of resistance here um, across the from 91 to 2023? OK, so all, over 30 years worth of reliance on a single source of resistance, we're going to start to see uh, development of um, insensitive populations, just like what we see with weeds. So these are. Uh, SCN populations on 88788. This female index over here, um, what we look at is if it is below this 10% index here, uh, it means that those can those populations can still effectively be managed by 88788. And if they are above that 10% line, we say that that population is no longer effectively controlled. And so seeing in 2015, we start to see these or these populations are starting to shift um, in which all of the, the populations evaluated here were above that 10% line. And then as we progress to 2022, we can see that that shift has increased even further, indicating here that uh, 88788 is being overcome substantially by these SEM populations. I will note, though, that this is in Iowa, not in North Dakota. Um, this is a situation that we are not seeing presently in this state, but if we do not take action, this is the sort of, um, this is the, the sort of SEN population shifts that we may see up here as well. Continuing from that, uh, variety trials that were performed again in Iowa, where these populations of 88788 and sensitive populations are present. Um, Greg Tilka, who is the, the applied nematologist at Iowa State, performs these trials every year. Um, we see in the, these are looking at yield on the y-axis. We see peaking varieties, two of them, 
everything in gray is a 88788 variety. And then these three susceptible checks are on the right-hand side. And what we see is that the average across these 88788 varieties is 51.2 bushels per acre. And then when we look at the peaking, we see a 72.4 bushel per acre. Now, this particular grower in this, where this field, uh, this trial was located, decided to plant this particular variety, which in this trial averaged 50 bushels per acre. So this grower, because of variety selection, left about 22 and a half bushels out in that field because of variety selection based off of the incorrect SCN resistance. Again, looking at this similar type of trend here, these SCN populations, uh, just like what we saw with 88788, in which the, they are shifting, becoming insensitive, uh, we are not seeing that same trend with peaking because peaking is still relatively newer. It has not been uh, over relied upon such as 88788 has been. Finally, the last management strategy that I want to talk about here is crop rotation. <clears throat> and so what we're looking at, again, is egg levels on the left-hand side. And we're looking at a uh, three-year um, uh, transition into wheat production out of soybean. So at the end of the season uh, in 2006, which was planted in soybean, we see egg levels over that 35,000 um, mark. Now, again, that is incredibly high levels. And so after one year of planting into wheat, we see those drop significantly down to just above 10,000. Okay. As we progress in years uh, into wheat, we continue to see a decrease, but that rate of decrease is reduced substantially. Um, this is something that we typically see is that we see that year one effect of rotating out is the most uh, substantial for reducing SCN levels. When rotating though, uh, one caveat here is that dry edible beans are known to be host to SCN. There are differences between market classes. Um, so uh, try to avoid planting into dry beans if we know that there is an SCN uh, hot field. And then uh, there are multiple different weed species that are also host to SCN. So a good weed management program is also important. We also want to rotate our varieties too. So just like what I've been talking about with our over-reliance on 88788, if we plant beans year one, plant a different variety than was previously planted the last time, um, and then rotate with peaking varieties if possible within uh, the companies that you work with. So overall for SCN, uh, again, just a recap here, the most important thing we wanna do is test those fields. Make sure we know what the levels are within your fields look like, are the management strategies working or are they not? Then we want to use resistant varieties and rotating those between years. So again, we're not relying on a single source of resistance and then rotating out of non-host crops. So corn or small grains are an effective option for this. There are also some nematicide seed treatments available. Some of these products, uh, we do not have a great deal of data here within this region yet, um, but there are effective uh, 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 program seed treatment products available that have good data um, shown to be efficacious in other regions, especially in Iowa. So shifting over to Phytophthora now. Uh, Phytophthora is what we call an oomycete, meaning that it loves and it thrives under very wet and flooded soil conditions. Um, and this is one of the most consistent disease problems that we see within the state. This particular field here, uh, this was down in Dickey County this, this past season. Uh, this was primarily driven by a lack of resistance available within that field. And then also very flooded conditions early within that season, which drove disease development. So again, Phytophthora uh, thrives under very wet and flooded conditions. Um, it's what we call a water mold, and they're able to swim and move freely within this water, which we'll show here in just a second. Um, but what's really important about this phytophthora is that it can infect and it will infect at any growth stage. So all the way from the seed up to uh, maturity, we can see that be affected. So this is a video here uh, showing these zoospores, or what we call the uh, of phytophthora, being able to move throughout that field. 
we can imagine this is a flooded soil here. This little fruiting body here is what we call a sporangia, and it's releasing these new zoospores into this water. We can see how freely these are moving around. Okay. <clears throat> and it should zoom out here in just a second. Now, this is what's going to happen under flooded soil conditions. Uh, and you can imagine soybean roots, these are going to be um, causing some severe infection when flooding occurs. Now, this is, this is something that I was really excited about. Again, being my very first growing season this past year, we went out and we did a large field survey across the entire state. This was one particular field that we found over, I, it was in Western Barnes County. Um, and this particular site had severe Phytophthora, but what's really this particular figure and this picture is that you can see some, some seedlings dying at the bottom of the screen, some seedlings that had been dead for a very long time. And then we see this progression of some older plants that had died recently and some active plants that are currently dying at this very moment that are just starting to wilt. We can also see that there are plants within that, that dead pocket there um, that are infected but they are clearly stunted relative to the healthy pockets of this particular field. Um, so this is a really great image here of Phytophthora being able to cause disease throughout the entire season. In order to manage Phytophthora, we do have resistance available. Um, but as, as a little bit of a history lesson here, okay, we have had RPS1A and the RPS is resistance to Phytophthora sojae. Um, RPS1A was initially released in 1965. Seven years later, RPS1 was no longer effective. Again, just like 88788, when we over relied on a single gene, we did start to see this resistance start to break down. Then in 1980, we saw RPS1C was released, a new resistance gene. <clears throat> and then five years later, RPS1K, 3A and 6 were released commercially for growers to use. Since this point in 1985, there have not been any more resistance genes that have been released commercially for growers to use. And as you would imagine, this over-reliance on these resistance genes has led to some, some issues with effectiveness. So this is data here out of, uh, out of here at NDSU. Uh, one of my predecessors, Berlin Nelson, was performing this work in which um, looking at the effectiveness of these RPS genes on populations across the state. So when we look at this, it's the frequency of isolates that are able to still infect and cause disease with these genes. So the larger the bar, the more ineffective these resistance genes are. And so we can see that in 1990, all, all four of these resistance genes were still very effective. But as we progress to 2015, uh, the RPS1C and 1K are becoming highly ineffective. Okay, these are no longer effective management tools for protecting against Phytophthora here in the state. However, 3A and 6 are still highly effective, <clears throat> but the problem is, is that 3A and 6 commercially are uh, lacking and that there's oftentimes no options for growers to use varieties with these resistant genes present. Now, as of uh, 2015, that was the last survey that was conducted. And so this past season in 2023, through support through the Soybean Council here in North Dakota, uh, we've been performing a newer Phytophthora survey. And so what we can see, this is our map. Each dot here represents a field that was sampled for Phytophthora, collaboration between our program as well as extension agents and industry individuals who have been able to help with this. We've collected about 142 fields across the state. And right now we are isolating these samples to uh, pull out the Phytophthora species to screen against these resistant genes further. And so to wrap this up here, um, I will just say that if any individuals watching this are interested in sending samples next year, uh, please reach out with the contact information below. We're very much interested in taking Phytophthora samples to test 
and identify what the resistant genes are that are effective in those regions. And then I'm also attaching a QR code here for the SCN Coalition if you are interested. And thank you very much.